Recently, I've been pondering the existence of giants. People from all over the world on every continent have myths, stories of giant people that once walked alongside us. For the most part, these stories, regardless of where they come from, seem to follow a specific pattern. The giants looked a certain way. Now, while the evidence for the existence of these giants is nearly non-existent, and we won't necessarily get into why, between Smithsonian cover-ups, religious cover-ups due to creationism, and people just being easy to dupe and creating their own hoaxes, there have been quite a lot that has discredited the existence of giants at all. But again, if they were to exist, what would make them possible? What could have happened to create them? These are the types of questions I want to talk about today. First, we must define, what is a giant? The definition of giant in the modern day is a person that has reached 7 feet tall, or 213 centimeters. Some of these individuals are born with disorders that make their heights detrimental to their health, often resulting in death. These disorders are known as giganticism and acromegaly, and in these cases, individuals have reached heights as tall as 8 foot 11 or 271 centimeters, such as in the case of Robert Wadlow, the Alton Giant, uh, who is the current tallest person on record. But both disorders create giant humans by creating a surplus of growth hormone in the human body. This causes people to grow to unnatural heights heights that supersede 7 feet. However, human biology says that your height eventually becomes unsustainable, and it eventually causes immense back pain, joint pains, and leg pain, and ultimately you will lose control of your legs and you won't be able to feel your feet because you will not be able to pump blood fast enough to your muscles. In other words, the human body lacks the efficiency to maintain a build that goes above 7 feet tall. And even today, individuals that are on the higher end of sustainability in human height often experience extreme pain in these exact places. The human body is optimized for endurance and stamina, not for strength. Meaning our bones and bodies are far more brittle than, let's say, the Neanderthal, which had far thicker bones and stockier frames. This means that ultimately, we have a height limit before our bodies begin to give out. Bones become brittle, blood is incapable of reaching the muscles quick enough to keep them functioning, and your body begins to shut down due to a lack of efficiency stemming from your immense height. A height that remained consistent with many of our ancient hominid ancestors at 5.75 feet or 175 centimeters. What this shows us is that while humans can grow to giant sizes, we would never be capable of sustaining a giant sized population that would be comparable to the myths surrounding true giants, some of which were said to be as tall as 20 or 30 feet. However, the genetics are there, it is within us. Currently today, one in every three million people on average are seven foot tall or more. Meaning it is possible innately for humans to be immensely tall and have it be sustainable, albeit with, in some cases, mild to severe pain in different aforementioned areas resulting from your height. To put this into perspective, that means roughly 125 people in the United States are 7 foot tall or more, which is an absolutely crazy small amount of people. But it's still there. The genes are there. The issue is that we lack specific adaptations to our gene pool to realistically maintain those heights without possible pain that might come along with it and without the possibility of death as a direct result of it. Things like stronger and thicker bones, sturdier, stockier frames with bigger torsos and shorter legs in order to maintain equilibrium, to maintain your balance, and to keep your blood pumping more efficiently. You would need a bigger heart, and you would need a broader nose, capable of pumping large amounts of air into you and getting that oxygen to your blood and throughout your body. And if you were able to get those adaptations, you would certainly be able to have humans that would be able to grow to extremely tall heights even realistically speaking, up to 30 feet. And these humans would be incredibly strong, and they would be at least as intelligent as we were 
but possibly more so. It's possible that because their brains would have been bigger, yet similar to ours, directly stemming from ours, that they would have inherited certain traits that would make their brain more efficient, such as an occipital bone, which we know makes the brain more efficient and comes from the Neanderthal, and a very small portion of people today have that. As well as the stocky frame, the thicker bones. With that being said, I want to get to my hypothesis as to what a giant would have to be, what it would have had to have come from, my idea for what it actually was in order for it to have existed at all. And to that, my friends, I bring you to my idea of a Neanderthal-human hybrid that ultimately became the myth for the giant. Humans today contain up to 3% Neanderthal DNA, but the DNA that you inherit is not always the same. Humans all around the world vary in the genes they have obtained from the Neanderthal. Some of us have stockier builds, brow ridges, occipital buns, bigger calf muscles, and denser muscle than our counterparts because of genes given to them by their Neanderthal ancestors. The acquisition of DNA that comes from a lineage outside of our own is something that has been dramatically downplayed and underrated in the modern day. When two species mix, traits that are the most beneficial from both ends will collide, creating a hybrid of superior traits that ultimately give that species a heightened chance of survival. Now, in some cases, you are also capable of inheriting traits that would be negative and could inhibit the ability for that species to survive. The idea is that over time, you will filter out the genes that don't work as well, and the genes that either don't pose a threat to your existence or make it better will stick around. What this ultimately means is that the genes that will be shared would otherwise take millions of years to develop normally in a species, allowing for massive jumps in potential. For example, we know today that another hominid cousin of ours, the Denisovan, contributed genes to people from modern day Tibet that allow them to live at higher altitudes in a way that modern regular people like what you most likely happen to be and what I am, who aren't from Tibet specifically, do not have. Meaning we could not live there comfortably, if at all. But they can, because they were able to take a gene from their Denisovan lineage that immediately gave them that capability, so they didn't have to evolve it over time. Who knows how long it could have taken for that to develop normally. That's what it means when these species combine. And that is absolutely massive. Now, these differences in the populations that stem from hybrid mixes can differ dramatically based on individual populations, and these dramatic differences, if given enough time, can ultimately create a new species. And that's literally, again, evolution in and of itself. This means that the Neanderthal and other archaic hominid DNA found in modern humans is most often going to be attributed with genetic gains, with the negatives of the genes often being things that don't really hamper the existence of the individual who has them. A good example of this would be the brow ridge, which can decrease an individual's ability to communicate and convey emotion due to a lack of motion in the eyes and eyebrows. While this would be seen as a disadvantage in society today, it is still possible for an individual to circumvent this disadvantage and remain mostly unscathed in their lifetime. As a result of this, they would pass their genes down, and it's possible that you would still see brow ridges, and we do. However, almost nobody has a pronounced brow ridge today. Yet, it still could be seen as an example of a genetic negative that comes from more archaic hominid DNA. So again, my only point there is that not everything that you inherit from another species is going to be amazing, is going to be this huge gain. But I think it's very safe to say that most of what you get is going to be a genetic gain. Now, humans obviously differ in appearance in incredibly dramatic ways. We range in height anywhere from 4 foot 8 to 7 feet tall. We range in body shape. Some people having very, very long legs and short torsos, and some people having big torsos and short legs. And these differences in body types have their own capabilities, with people with longer legs typically being better at running, and people with bigger torsos typically being stronger and capable of exerting more power. 
Some of us have incredibly thin calf muscles, some of us have very big calf muscles naturally. Some of us have coarser hair, others of us have incredibly long hair. Some of us have a pinched nose, some of us have a flat nose, some of us have flatter faces, some of us have more pronounced features. It doesn't matter, because we're all still human. But what it does show is the extreme and vast diversity of our genetics and adaptability of our species. But even we have limits, and height is one of them. As I said, it seems to be that at the upper 6 foot range, or roughly 7 feet tall, the body seems to react extremely negatively. You have to think, much of the reason why these individuals who get too tall live long at all is because they live in a modern society that is capable of upkeeping it. Now put yourself in an ancient Paleolithic society, one of which would have been far harder, with much more danger, and you could see how if an individual had to live with extreme pain or biological physical problems, they probably wouldn't make it long, and it would probably be filtered out very quickly. But if extreme size was something that could be maintained, physically used in a way that would not negatively but possibly positively impact an ancient hominid, it would be incredibly useful for us because we would have essentially no predators. We're dying less, and our extreme intelligence means that the acquisition of food probably would actually be easy and sustainable, even for such a large body. So the idea is that our ancient ancestors inherited genes from the Neanderthal that gave them stockier frames, thicker and stronger bones, stronger muscles, more muscle, denser muscle, a broader nose that allowed for an intake of more air, and due to sheer size they would have probably evolved to have bigger organs, a bigger heart specifically, and a more efficient body for pumping blood throughout it. And then, through natural selection, individuals could have gotten increasingly tall over time who were capable of maintaining that height due to these genetic adaptations and then passing it down to their children. Which means they didn't have to get everything right the first time either. The first generation could have gotten as high as 6 foot 4 and then it kept going, 6 foot 8. 7 foot 3, oh but look, little Jimmy is 7 foot 3, but he's actually fine, he's perfectly fine, his body works, nothing is going to break down on him, there's no disorder there, everything just happened to slowly work its way up, become more and more efficient, until possibly maybe you could get to a human of an absolutely absurd range. It's a hypothesis based on facts that could be entirely unrelated. But again, what supports my theory? Well, besides everything I just said, many of the myths surrounding giants depict them as having red hair and being cannibals. Both of these traits are also directly related to our sister species in the Neanderthal. Now, while the Neanderthal was on average slightly shorter than modern day humans, they did have far stronger bodies and a lot more muscle, two things that would have been ideal for a taller build. This could be some subtle evidence for a large portion of Neanderthal DNA in these giants that gave them an appearance closer to Neanderthals with human traits, and perhaps in cases where they did not look like this and they looked more like humans of the area, perhaps that's a case where it had a smaller portion of Neanderthal traits and more human. This theory would support two forms of human Neanderthal breeding. One is going to be one in which we see Neanderthals with a small portion of human DNA that allowed for taller heights that were therefore then sustainable due to the natural stocky frame of the Neanderthal and a more efficient build with genes that again support thicker bones and more muscle that then increased over time. And two, uh, one in which humans with a small portion of Neanderthal DNA, no different than today, just selecting for different genes than we see in people today, allowed for a tall human with Neanderthal traits, such as the stronger, thicker bones, denser muscle, and larger torso than legs. But it would probably have more human looking features in the face and it would probably also be slightly shorter than one that was more Neanderthal in its genetic capability. Because the linchpin here, for what ultimately allows the height to go to extremes, seems to be, in my theory, the Neanderthal traits. Again, I am fully claiming pseudoscience here because it's raw conjecture. I do want to make that clear. 
Now, in both of the cases I mentioned, it's possible that Giganticism or Acromalagi are the culprits for some of the more dramatic heights seen in these hybrids, but the linchpin is the stronger and more efficient frame given to them by their Neanderthal DNA that allowed for these heights to be realistically sustained. Therefore, the Giganticism or Acromalagi gene could possibly be a net positive rather than a net negative as a direct result of the Neanderthal genes that kind of cancelled out many of the negatives. This would imply that Giganticism in these cases was incredibly quick and very sudden, and that giants, again, wouldn't be their own general race, but that they would be human individuals that shared certain traits very specific Neanderthal traits, and then specific genes that led to them to look a certain way. So what do you think of the hybrid giant hypothesis that I've sort of concocted with a variety of different bits and pieces of knowledge of the world all mixed together, swirled in with some conjecture and subjectiveness, and a little bit of fantasy as well? Is it the most plausible way for giants to have existed to you? Or do you not believe in them at all? Or do you think it could be a completely different subspecies? Something completely different from the Neanderthal, from the Denisovan, and from Homo sapiens, yet obviously still related? Let me know in the comments section below, and also let me know if you want to see more of the pseudoscience ideas on ancient hominins and ancient apes, such as the giants, because I'd love to talk more about it if that is something you guys would like to see. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video and my idea on the possibility of giants and what they could have been. Like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.